Hi, this is Ron Sipsick. In this particular segment, we're going to take a look at a model called the Kink Demand Curve Model. And this is a model that's used in uh, trying to understand oligopoly markets. An oligopoly market is a market where there are just a few competitors. And the number of firms is so small that all the competitors know each other. And if the firms know each other, they probably strategize against each other. In other words, they form plans against each other, which leads us into the next characteristic. These firms are interdependent competitors. What does it mean to be an interdependent competitor? Interdependence has to do with how firms respond to the action of other firms. If you're interdependent, if you're in an interdependent market, one firm's, let's write this out, one firm's action will affect the behavior of other firms. We don't see this in pure competition. In pure competition, we see independence. Independence is where the actions of one firm have no impact on the actions of others. So if one corn farmer decides to produce more corn, all the other corn farmers are not going to respond to that by trying to produce more corn or in some way trying to counteract that action. We don't see this in uh, monopolistic competition. Again, the number of firms is great enough where each firm does not know all of its competitors. And so one firm's actions um, are probably not even recognized by the other competitors, and those other competitors are not going to change their behavior on the basis of one firm changing its behavior. So if one hair salon were to run a perm special or run a haircut special where they were going to knock 10% off of haircuts on a certain day, it's not like all the other hair salons would notice that and respond to that. And then, of course, monopoly is a situation where there's only one firm, so interdependence is not even an issue. Um, there's no one to be interdependent with or independent of. So of the three market types we talked about prior to this, uh, pure competition, monopolistic competition are characterized by independence. Monopoly is characterized by neither interdependence nor independence, oligopoly, is the only market type where we have what is called interdependence. This, this results in some very, very interesting outcomes because if one firm does something, it can count on other firms responding to that and counteracting it. So in other words, my outcomes are partly dependent on what my competitor does. For instance, if one of the major automobile companies, say Ford, were to run a certain financing special where we're going to give 60 months or 72 months, same as cash, same as cash would be 0% financing, then other major car companies would need to respond to that somehow. They might match that offer or they might come up with some other offer to counteract that. Uh, but the action of my competitors will cause me to change my behavior. And so my behavior is not just dictated by market forces, uh, supply and demand, costs, those sorts of things. It's also dictated by the behavior of other competitors in the market. This is the nation, uh, nature of an interdependent market. And then the last characteristic we're going to note here, besides a uh, few firms and interdependent competitors, is these firms engage in product differentiation. The interesting thing is, in these markets, product differentiation is often personal. So competition, again, is personal. When one firm does something, the other firms are going to notice and counteract that, that action with some other action. All right. So competition is personal. In the other markets, pure competition and monopolistic competition, uh, competition is not personal. Where you have independence, where firms are independent, their competition is not personal because each firm is not responding to the behavior of another particular firm. All right, so with this background in mind, let's talk about the kinked demand curve model. I'm going to go ahead and scroll down, and I'm going to show you uh, the idea by building the model. 
All right, I've already set up a framework here that I want to use. Notice I have two demand curves drawn in the same space. One of the demand curves is relatively flat. One of the demand curves is relatively steep. The flat demand curve, we're going to call this flat demand curve the do not follow demand curve. Now I'll explain this here in just a minute, but let's just go ahead and label that flat demand curve the do not follow demand curve. And then the steep demand curve, we want to label that the do follow, do follow demand curve. Now what I want to do is I want to shade in the flat portion of the do not follow demand curve above the point of intersection. So where those two curves meet, those two dotted lines meet, I want to find that point of intersection. I want to shade in the do not follow above the line of or point of intersection and I want to shade in the do follow Sorry about that, my hand's not very steady. And I haven't really had that much coffee today. I think I can improve upon that though. So let me, we want to uh, impress you with our shading ability here. So let me try again here. So I'm gonna shade in green over the, oh, I guess not, I better get my pen working. I'm gonna shade in green over this steep portion. Okay, good enough. So, here's the point of intersection. The flat segment of the do not follow is shaded in above the, the intersection point. The steep portion of the do follow demand curve is shaded in below, below the intersection point. Now here's the idea. This, this demand curve, this shaded in portion is actually the demand curve. So the demand curve has what is called a kink in it. A kink, a kink is a break. So all of the demand curves we've drawn up to this point have been uh, continuous. In other words, they've been straight lines and they have no break in them. All right? So this has a break in it. Its slope changes. Here the slope is relatively, it's negative, and this curve is relatively flat, whereas this curve's slope is still negative but it's relatively what? Relatively steep. So the slope of the demand curve abruptly changes. Where it changes, we have what is called a kink or a break in the demand curve. Now, if this firm, this oligopolist, raises its price, it runs the risk. I say a risk because it's possible that if it raises its price, other firms in the market might raise their price as well. For instance, say we're talking about an airline. Say we have five airlines flying along a certain route. Okay, say we're looking at five airlines flying between Atlanta and Detroit or Detroit and Atlanta. Say that one of the airlines, because of higher fuel costs, wants to raise its fares from P1 to P2. Now it runs a risk. You say, what do you mean it runs a risk? Well, if other airlines raise their fares as well, you would be on the do-follow demand curve and you wouldn't sell that many fewer seats. Okay? But if you raise your fare as an airline and your competitors do not follow, you run the risk of seeing your sales drop actually a lot from Q1 all the way down to Q2. So here's the, the issue is, is I don't know what my competitors are going to do. In essence, I could be facing two demand curves at the very same time. If they do follow, my competitors do follow me in my price movement, I'm on a steep demand curve. But if they do not follow me, I'm on a flat demand curve. All right. So in this case, let's suppose I raise my fares because of higher fuel costs and my competitors decide not to follow me up. They basically hang me out in the wind. Well, what's going to happen is I'm going to lose a lot of sales. You go, so what? Well, my buyers are going to go to other competitors. And essentially what's happened here is I've raised my price 
a little bit. My sales have dropped a lot. And what happens to my revenues? My revenues actually, excuse me, my revenues actually drop. Now, I would have never raised my fares had I expected my revenues to drop. I must have raised my fares believing there was a chance that my other, the other firms would follow me. So how is it that I could raise my price, my sales would drop a lot, and my revenues would drop? It's because my competitors do not follow. Okay? Now, let's go to the other side of the coin. Say that I'm an airline and I'm flying against four other competitors on a certain route. Say that I want to um, try to uh, engage in some sort of pricing action that would pick up some sales from my competitors. So let's say that I want to lower my fares. I lower my fares from P1, I'm going to call this P2 prime. So I lower my prayers, my fares quite a bit, but my sales, because I'm moving down a relatively steep demand curve, my sales only increase a little bit. In other words, I run the risk that my competitors will not follow me, will follow me down. So the, the, the issue is I could raise my fare, I raise my fares and, and sell a lot fewer seats, or I could lower my fares and not sell many more seats because my competitors actually follow me down a relatively steep demand curve. Now, I don't know what they're going to do. I lower my fares believing they are not going to follow me down, but it turns out they do follow me down, and I don't sell that many more seats. What happens to my revenues if I lower my, lower my fares a lot, and I don't sell that many more seats? Well, let's look at this. I cut my fares or lower my price, but I don't sell that many more seats. Why? Because all of the other competitors cut their fares. My buyers are relatively what? Price insensitive. What happens to my revenues? My revenues drop. Why did my revenues drop? Because my competitors do follow. In essence, what I've done here is I've instigated a price war. I've instigated a price war. I cut my price. All of my competitors have matched me. And now we're all hurting. Why? Because we don't pick up that many more seats. We certainly don't pick up seats from our competitors. They all cut their fares as well. And our revenues actually drop. So one of the issues an oligopolis faces is this whole issue of the response of its competitors. And the kink demand curve is a, is a really, it's a, it's a very old model. It's been around for many, many years in economics. Uh, it's, it's been taught for well over 50 years in econ courses just like this one. But it, it's, it's still descriptive of the behavior, possible behavior of oligopolis. So what's important to remember here is this demand curve is the demand curve of one firm. Maybe this is airline this is airline number one, and this other this airline has maybe three or four other competitors, and it doesn't know how each of those competitors will respond to its price change. Okay? And what we can see here is I could raise my price and lose, and I could lower my price and lose. And what this tends to lead to, if we're in this kind of situation where there's a possibility I could raise my price and get hurt or lower my price and get hurt, you'll see oftentimes an avoidance an avoidance of what of price competition so firms are not going to be likely to want to compete on the basis of price because they can get hurt if they raise their price they can get hurt if they lower their price okay so again, the idea is I don't know what my competitors will do. I have no idea how they'll exactly respond. 
and if I miss if I raise my price and they don't follow I get hurt if I lower my price and they do follow I get hurt so this tends to cause me to not want to mess around with price because I can get hurt either way I go okay that's called the kink demand curve model and let me just go ahead and jump off of this explanation into something called price leadership uh, what is called a price leader and I'm going to use a different color here I'll just go ahead and use this color and I'm going to draw a very steep demand curve and this will be the steep demand curve is a do follow demand curve I'm going to pick a point out on this demand curve Uh, we don't need equilibrium on that. Let's just call that P1. And we'll call this Q1. Now, in some markets, one of the firms in the market will establish a position where it's perceived to be a price leader. And there's a number of reasons why this could happen. Maybe the firm is dominant. Maybe it's a very, very large firm, and the other firms in the market are relatively small. Or perhaps um, it's recognized as some sort of technological leader or innovator in the market, and people consider it a wise firm, and other competitors tend to follow its behavior because it's because of past behavior has been proven correct in a lot of its past decision making. Well, in the case of a price leader, uh, price leadership relationship, if this firm is the price leader and it raises its price, it doesn't really have to worry that other firms will not follow. If the other firms have shown a history of following, then you can see that this firm raises its price and the other firms follow. So yes, the firm sells less, but not that much less. So in the case of price leadership, by the way, this is not collusion. I'm not saying that these firms are talking to each other. I'm saying that one firm raises its price and the other firms see that and raise their price. The firms are not talking to each other. That's illegal. The firms are actually just watching each other. And because there's only a few firms in the market, we can see what the other firms are doing and we can respond quickly to their behavior. So in this case, P goes up quite a bit. Q doesn't drop much. And as a result of that, revenues go up. So if firms can establish a price leadership relationship, we saw this in the 1960s with the domestic automobile industry. Um, General Motors used to be a price leader. General Motors used to have over 50 percent of domestic U.S. sales. And when General Motors in the 60s would raise its prices, say they would raise their prices 6 percent, the other firms in the market at that time it was Ford, Chrysler, and a, and a company called American Motors, they would religiously raise their prices 6%. So whatever GM would do, the other firms in the market would, uh, would follow. And there were a couple reasons for this. Uh, General Motors was definitely a dominant firm. The other firms, Ford, Chrysler, and American Motors, were very small compared to General Motors. Um, and so from size alone, from the standpoint of size alone, one of those smaller firms did not want to try to start some sort of price war with General Motors. In other words, General Motors wants to raise its price and the other firms don't follow. And then General Motors brings its price down or even cuts its price to punish those firms. So to avoid a price war with General Motors, this very strong and dominant firm, Chrysler, Ford, American Motors would simply follow General Motors whenever it wanted to raise prices. And General Motors knew this and General Motors would behave accordingly. It could pass its cost increases on uh, and it could trust that the other companies in the market would religiously follow. All right. A second reason is uh, General Motors was quite innovative in the 60s and Ford and, Ford and Chrysler and uh, American Motors were really uh, pulling up the rear. Um, and 
when General Motors would do something, these other firms took notice, not only in the area of price, but in the area of product, promotion, placement, those sorts of things. So General Motors was a price leader in the 60s and 70s. Now that ended in the 80s. There were a, a number of things that happened in the automobile industry that changed that dynamic, one of which was a, uh, General Motors began to lose market share to the Japanese. Uh, companies like Toyota and Honda. And so there were some major structural changes in the U.S. automobile industry that uh, caused the other players to stop following General Motors. Chrysler began very aggressive marketing in the early 80s under an executive named Lee Iacocca. And Lee Iacocca was, uh, through Chrysler, was one of the first companies to offer rebates, you know, $1,000, $1,500 rebates on cars, basically price cuts off of the sticker price and incentives, financing incentives. And this destabilized, in a sense, this price leadership relationship. Okay, so let me just quickly review again. If, if we're in a situation where we might raise our price and other competitors might follow, um, then we're going up a steep demand curve, okay? And that's price leadership. But if we might raise our price and the other firms might not follow us up, then we're in a kink demand curve relationship. The demand curve goes flat here, becomes very elastic, and the firm can really take it on the nose if it tries to raise its price. Okay? Well, that ends, uh, that ends our lesson on the kink demand curve and a very brief mention of price leadership.